Hello and welcome. My name is David Delk. I'm president of the Alliance for Democracy. Thank you for joining us today for a brief presentation by Dr. Samuel Metz entitled Healthcare Reform. What's the least I need to know? The purpose of this session is to provide answers to the questions about health care reform that thousands of people are asking and to make these questions and answers available to as many people through the website of Healthcare for All Oregon as well as via the Alliance for Democracy's cable access program, The Populist Dialogues. This videotaping session is being produced by me here in the studios of Portland Community Media. Dr. Samuel Metz is a Portland anesthesiologist who works at various sites throughout the Willamette Valley. He has been active in healthcare reform for nearly four years. He represents the Portland chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program and Healthcare for All Oregon, and is a member of the is a founding member of Mad as Hell Doctors. His opinions have been published in the Oregonian, Street Roots, and the New York Times. He has appeared on talk radio shows in Oregon and on national public radio. He says his main musical instrument is the Jews harp. So on behalf of our sponsors, the Alliance for Democracy and the Portland chapter of the League of Women Voters, please welcome Dr. Samuel Metz. Thank you very much, David. Healthcare reform is the second leading cause of bar fights in America today. Uh, what's number one in most areas of the country, it's women. In Corvallis, it's sports. And here in Portland, it's fluoridation. <laughs> what makes healthcare reform so controversial is its complexity. One out of every five dollars that we're going to spend will be spent on health care. It doesn't obey the normal laws of supply and demand. As the costs of health care go up, the demand for health care doesn't change. And it's a sort of Damocles hanging over every American family. Most of us are just one hospitalization away from financial catastrophe. What I'd like to do is rearrange a lot of the material that you've already heard into some structure that'll make understanding healthcare reform a little easier. So you can tell for yourselves whether something makes sense. Now, I'm going to do this in three questions with three answers each, makes it easy to remember. Why do we need health care reform? What is health care reform? And how do we get it? First, how many people here agree with the statement, the United States has the best health care system in the world? Well, let's just say it's a minority. But you're not alone. A surprising number of congressional leaders in Washington are on record as saying the United States has the best health care system in the world. Most of the last crop of presidential candidates said at some point that we have the best health care system in the world. It's becoming increasingly difficult to defend that position. Why? The United States spends twice as much on health care it's the average industrialized country. That's per capita. That's as part of the gross domestic product, twice as expensive. No one spends more than we do. We are the most expensive country in the world for health care. And you can bet if there are any alien visitors who come to our planet with health care plans, they won't have created anything like us and we're the most expensive healthcare system in the universe. On most matters of public health, though, the United States ranks at or near the bottom of industrialized countries. We're talking the basic building blocks of civilization. Maternal mortality. There are more than 30 other countries where a pregnant woman and her baby have a greater chance of surviving the pregnancy. We're talking about diabetic foot care. 
The United States cuts off more than twice as many necrotic diabetic feet as the average industrialized country because our diabetics aren't getting the care they need. No one cuts off more diabetic feet than the United States. Unless you're Paula Dean, who's selling high fructose corn syrup cookbooks and endorses anti-diabetic medications, this is a bad place to be a diabetic. We lose more people to treatable diseases than any other country on a per capita basis. These are people who wouldn't have died of their treatable disease if they had lived in Saskatchewan or Portugal or Iceland or France or Japan or Finland or any other industrialized country. 44,000 people we lose every day, excuse me, every year because they can't get the health care they need. That's a big figure. If lack of access to health care were listed by the Center for Disease Control as a cause of death, it would be the 10th leading killer in the United States. We shouldn't be proud of this. And finally, it's destroying our families. The majority of personal bankruptcies in the United States each year occur in families are precipitated by medical crises in families that had health insurance, or at least they had health insurance at the time the crisis began. Medical bankruptcy is an American disease. You will not lose your home to a treatable disease if you live in another industrialized country, but you will here. It's the leading cause of bad credit in the United States, medical debt, and it's getting worse and we're the only country that has the concept of medical debt. So why do we need health care reform? We're the most expensive country in the world for health care. Our public health, the results of our health care, are at the bottom. And health care is destroying the integrity of our families. Now, what is health care reform? It's not a simple question. For example, the Affordable Care Act will increase the number of insurance policies that are sold. It will place the burden for bad outcomes on providers rather than payers. It will reduce government spending on health care. These are all good, right? It's not what health care reform is about. I suggest that when we talk about health care reform, we're talking about three basic fundamentals, easy to measure goals. The first one is access. We want access for ourselves and our families to health care, no matter what happens to us, no matter how old, poor, sick, retired, or fired we get. Second, we want lower costs. And remember, taxes, health insurance premiums, out-of-pocket expenses, it's all our money. Reducing government spending and increasing the premiums for health care is not reform. Reducing the, the amount we pay for premiums but increasing the amount we spend out-of-pocket is not reform. We have to reduce costs. And finally, we want better health. That's what we want from health care reform. We want access, lower cost, better health. Third question. Every other industrialized country in the world provides better care to more people for less money than we do. How do they do it? What are they doing that we're not doing? What are we doing that they're not doing? Again, it's not an easy question because if you look around the world, they aren't all the same. I mean, to listen to talk radio, it's all socialized medicine once you use your passport. But there are as many varieties of healthcare out there as there are in the United States. 
But when we look at all of these other countries, they have three common characteristics that we don't have in our country that depends upon private health insurance. First, they treat all patients equally without discriminating against the sick. We're the only country that sorts the population into you're healthy, then you can get private health insurance. You're not, well, we'll improvise. And of course, you're only in the healthy pool as long as you're healthy. And when you're not healthy, now you're in another pool. We're the only country that first breaks us into the rich and the poor, the employed, the unemployed, the sick and the healthy, and improvises how we're going to provide health care to all these different kinds of people. The first common characteristic is everybody's in it together, no matter who you are. The second common characteristics of successful health care systems is they encourage people to seek health care. Other countries don't try to discourage you from taking your sick child to see a physician, maybe they're not really sick, by using high copays, high deductibles, excluded conditions. The philosophy once you leave the United States is rather than having the patient figure out if they need health care before they see a physician, the physician determines if the patient needs health care after she sees the patient. And the third characteristic of every successful health care system is the financing is done by publicly accountable, transparent, not-for-profit agencies. In most countries, in most successful healthcare systems, you can make a profit providing healthcare. We're the only country that allows a profit to be made financing healthcare. And remember, financing is a brokerage. You take money from patients, you give it to providers. That's all it is. By the way, if you have a healthcare system that includes everybody, encourages health care and uses just one publicly accountable, transparent, not-for-profit financing agency. We call that single payer. What we don't realize is we already have single payer systems within the United States and here in Oregon. Almost every large business in the United States and in Oregon self-funds its own health care. That is, the employees and employers contribute to a fund that then pays providers directly without private health insurance. That's a private single-payer system. Every government health care system is a single-payer system. And this includes the Indian Health Service. It includes TRICARE for the armed services and their families. The VA, Medicare, Medicaid, these are all single-payer agencies. And every one of these single-payer agencies, whether it's private or public, for comparable patients, provides better care to more people for less money. Now, let's look at those three common characteristics of successful systems. That is, include everybody, encourage health care, and not-for-profit financing. There's some interesting observations about what these countries and what these systems have in common. First, there's no fixed role for government. In some of these successful systems, the government does everything. In some of them, it does nothing. There's no, there's no part of this that says, if you want a successful healthcare system, the government has to run it. Dealer's choice. The second observation from these three common characteristics is that they have to do with the financing of health care, not the delivery. What's the difference? Finance, financing asks the question, who participates, who pays, and how do we collect? Single payer and private health insurance are two examples of different financing mechanisms. The delivery system determines which providers get paid how much, for what services, under what conditions, 
to which patients. Fee-for-service is an example of a delivery system. Accountable care organizations are examples of a delivery system. Oregon's coordinated care organizations are examples of delivery systems. What we can learn is that if you have a solid financing system, you can use any delivery system you want. You can use fee-for-service. You can use accountable care organizations. You can use unaccountable care organizations. You can use uncoordinated care organizations. You can come up with any delivery system you want. If you have the three fundamentals of a successful financing system, you can make it work. The flip side that we're having a great deal of trouble learning is if you don't have a successful financing system that includes these three characteristics, no delivery system will work. So let's review. We need health care reform because we're too expensive, our health care is terrible, our families are going down the drain. How will we recognize health care reform when we see it? It'll provide access, it'll lower costs, and it'll make our health better. How do we get it? We create a successful financing system that has the three characteristics. We have to include everybody, we have to encourage health care, and we need publicly accountable, transparent, not-for-profit financing. You now understand enough to make sense of almost everything you're going to see out there. And if you discover that most of what you're saying doesn't make sense, it's not your fault. There's a lot out there that doesn't make sense and now you can identify it. I thank you all very much. What I would like to do is now give you a moment to digest that and I'll take questions from you folk. Mm -hmm. That we've gotten away from a healthcare providing system and we're now in the healthcare business. Thank you, better said than with, I With the implication that profits are polluting our healthcare system and that's, what making, that's what's making us so inefficient. It turns out that around the world there are profits made many different countries providing health care. Mm -hmm. Many countries have for-profit hospitals, for-profit physicians, for-profit providers, and they're doing much better than, than we are. They're half as expensive with better health. What they don't allow are profits to be made financing health care. We're the only country that has a for-profit health insurance model, the financing end. That is what is driving the inefficiency in our healthcare system. It's the profit motive. It's just the entire business model of our private insurance industry. And it really doesn't matter whether you're for-profit or not-for-profit, the business model is the same. What's the Oregon legislature doing about single payer? There are two bills in the legislature right now. One is House Bill 3260. The legislature would authorize the Oregon Health Authority to conduct a study of our health care financing options. It will be privately financed, so it's not taxpayer dollars. It's already passed out of the House Health Care Committee unanimously nine to zero, and it will very likely be recommended favorably out of the House Ways and Means Committee. That will probably happen in this session. Next Monday, May 13th, the House Health Care Committee is having a hearing on House Bill 2922, which is, would establish a single-payer health care system for all of Oregon, and I encourage you all to pay close attention to that. The, what about the profit making in the pharmaceutical industry? We do have a lot of profits made uh, in the pharmaceutical industry and eventually we need to come up with a better system but that's not what's driving healthcare costs in the United States. 
Here, here are a few numbers to keep in mind. Americans spend about $220 billion every year on medicine of one kind or another. Americans also waste about $350 billion a year on money that we pay to insurance companies that doesn't get translated into healthcare. That's the overhead for the health insurance industry and it's the money that we providers spend to collect from the health insurance industry. Tomorrow, if every large drug company in the United States said, we see the light, we're giving away our medications for free, we still wouldn't save as much money as if we converted to a single payer financing system, just to put that in perspective. About when we talk about encouraging patients to see healthcare, do they see their physicians earlier? The answer is probably yes. If you think about it, how many times have you had been sick or had a sick child or somebody is sick in your family and you decided, I don't think I'm going to see a physician. I'm not going to get this checked out because what if it's nothing? Then I get charged and I haven't used up my deductible or I don't have any insurance at all. So yes, we're talking about people seeing physicians as soon as they think they need to see one. What about people who don't want to seek health care because they'll be labeled with a pre-existing condition? With a single-payer health care system, all of our health care is prepaid. You're in the system. You cannot be dropped. You have a pre-existing payment. You don't have a pre-existing condition. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what your disease is, you're going to get treated for it because you've already paid through the single payer system. You don't have to worry about having that stigma or paying for the rest of your life and not being able to get health insurance. We're all part of the system. How much is the United States losing in, I'll rephrase it, recoverable administrative costs? That is, if we had a single payer system, how much less would we be paying? It's hard to get a good number, but the best number I saw was that $350 billion every year. Keep in mind that there are some estimates uh, from $200 billion all the way up to $500 billion. We do know that other countries that don't use our financing system pay a lot less than we do and they get a lot of care for. Now, another number. If we opened up our health care system and said, all of you folk who don't have access to health care, come on down. And all of you folk who haven't gotten health care because you're discouraged by your deductibles or your co-pays, come on, there's no charge for it. We would need an extra 200 to $250 billion every year to pay for that health care. If we try to pay for it by issuing new insurance policies, well, we've got to come up with an extra $250 billion from somewhere. There's a 10% increase in what we're spending. If we finance health care with single payer, we recover $350 billion, which is $100 billion more than we need to provide health care, comprehensive health care, to everyone in the country. That's what we're talking about. Are other states working on statewide health care plans? Vermont has already enacted its version. It hasn't applied it yet. As a matter of fact, it's illegal for it to apply it until 2017 because of the Affordable Care Act, which forbids states from doing anything other than health insurance exchanges until 2017. And then you have to get a note from the Secretary of Health and Human Services. That's why you should pay a great deal of attention to the presidential election in <coughs> 2016 because that president is going to appoint the secretary and that secretary doesn't have to issue a waiver. But Vermont has already taken the step. It's, it's ready to go when it gets permission. Other states all have their equivalent of health care for all Oregon. They all have their single-payer movements. Some are more active than others. 
California twice passed single-payer legislation, both houses of its legislature, that would have established single-payer for all of California. Twice that legislation was vetoed by then Governor Schwarzenegger. What is the role of an insurance model when we're talking about health care? And you're right, insurance is for when things go bad. And you pay extra for when things go bad. And the idea is to spread the risk. Health care is a little different. We're all going to need health care. We don't know when, we don't know how much, we don't know what it's going to be. But we all need it. It's like police protection. You don't need it until you do. But it's hard to tell when you're going to need it. And then you're going to be real glad that you have it. And you don't want to have to buy an insurance policy for police protection. You know? Hello, 911, can I have your police protection insurance number, please? The first uh, $50 will be applied to your deductible, and there will be a $25 copay. How can I help you? Well, I just hear screaming. I'll wait till I hear shooting. Thank you. <laughs> With health care, you don't want, you want it when you need it. You don't want to have to think beforehand. And the idea of having insurance is not the most effective method of providing health care. So I'm going to make sure that before you leave, you understand the value of writing a letter to your state representatives. And it just has to have three sentences in it. Dear representative or senator, one, here's how our health care system has failed me, my family, my clients, my friends, my business. Two, I want single-payer health care in Oregon. Three, I want you to make it happen. Sincerely, your constituent. P.S. If you want to be sure of my vote, please call me back and tell me how you're going to make this happen. I think we're going to close on that. I thank you all very much, and uh, let's go out there and work for health care reform. Thank you. <laughs>